Hello, welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. My name is Claire Shorenstein and I am a board certified sports dietitian and endurance athlete with over 10 years of experience working with teenage and adult athletes of all abilities. Today, I have an Ask Me Anything episode that is long overdue. I think the last time I did this was over two years ago, and I've been collecting questions since August, so I'm sorry it's taken me so long to record this, but I've got four awesome questions today, all very different, and let's just dive right in. Okay, so question number one is, is collagen effective and beneficial for runners, and what is the best dosage? Thank you for your amazing podcast. Well, number one, you're welcome. I'm glad you're enjoying it. And this really is a great question. So before I answer it, I really want to make sure that everyone knows and understands what collagen is. So collagen is a major structural component of the body, and it's actually the most abundant protein, making up around one third of the protein in our body. Most of our collagen is type one, which is made up of non-essential amino acids or In other words, the ones that we can make in the body. And this type of collagen is found in bone, muscle, and connective tissue. We do make collagen, as I said, but we make less collagen as we get older. And that starts as young as like in our 20s. Um, So, and then thinking about other like environmental things or other things like too much sun exposure or smoking, like environmental pollution, alcohol intake, and a diet that is low in like fruits and vegetables and other plant foods, all of that can, can lead to more oxidative stress, which in turn can also reduce collagen synthesis. Collagen can be found in the diet. So whenever we're talking about supplementation, we always want to think about, okay, can we get this through food, right? Um, So it can be found in the diet. We can get it. Things like bone broth is a rich source, um, chicken and fish skin, also fish bones, as well as like gelatin, like Knox gelatin. But it is hard hard to get enough in the diet um, if you're looking to get a really specific dosage. Also, many of these foods, uh, they're not exactly practical to eat right before you exercise, which is when you're supposed to take collagen. So I don't know about you. I'm not exactly like munching on fish bones or whatever right before I go for a run. Um, So this is where supplementation can be really convenient. It can be easier to dose and time um, and also just to deliver the really specific amino acids that are needed for collagen synthesis. And FYI for my vegans and vegetarians out there, there is no vegan or vegetarian collagen supplement. Um, These supplements do come from cows, pigs, uh, fish and chicken. So unfortunately, if you are a vegan or vegetarian and you're looking for uh, a collagen supplement that fits your diet, you're not going to get it, at least not now. So the question now is, should we supplement with collagen or or what type of runner or other athlete um, should be supplementing? And as with all, you know, with everything, like it depends on what's going on. So there is research to support supplementation in various training and recovering settings. Um, also for aesthetic things like skin appearance, as I mentioned, it's like a huge, I think it's like 75% of, of the weight of dry skin weight. So it's like a huge component of skin. Um, and we do really see as we get older, obviously like visible signs of aging in our skin. And that is in part linked to our reduced collagen production. So let's just go through some examples. So for instance, research does support supplementation to improve pain management for things like tendonitis and joint pain, especially in the context of physical activity or movement. Um, It also can be used to treat and or prevent certain diseases like osteoarthritis. Um, It can increase bone strength or reduce uh, fracture risk. And it can help support the returns to sport after injury by helping to repair bone and skin and ligaments and or tendons. And lastly, it may also be helpful to take during high training volume periods to support collagen production when, you know, the body may be struggling to keep up with various demands. Um, So those are just some instances where we may see it being useful and there's research to support that. The recommended dose is around 10 to 15 grams, sometimes up to 20 grams, and you're supposed to be taking it around 30 to 60 minutes prior to exercise, or let's say you're injured and doing physical therapy, it would be prior to your PT. And that's really because the amino acids from collagen, it takes a while to peak in the bloodstream. Also, tendons and ligaments, they don't have great blood supply, um, but exercise can really help improve this and their ability to, you know, like take on these supplemental amino acids for recovery and repair. 
Additionally, it's recommended that you take vitamin C along with the collagen because vitamin C plays a key role in collagen synthesis. It's a cofactor in that um, process. And it's often actually, depending on what supplement you use, it's often already a part of that supplement. So you might see vitamin C along with the collagen in there. But if not, you can simply have a food with vitamin C. Like let's say you're mixing a powder in orange juice, you're having some strawberries or whatever else you're having. Now, powdered collagen supplements, they can really be easily mixed into fluids like water or juice. It's also fine, by the way, to add to hot beverages like coffee or tea. You know, we often hear people adding collagen to their coffee. That's totally fine. Um, just remember it's before exercise, not after. So collagen should never be used as a protein powder supplement post-workout. It's a poor quality protein from the standpoint of recovery, and you're much better off using like a whey protein or a vegan blend. And I mentioned this because I see a lot of people, because you know, collagen is very trendy and you know, you walk through any store or Costco or wherever and like Vital Proteins is ever, which is a great brand, you know, all these, but everyone seems to be taking collagen for all sorts of reasons. Um, and people don't always understand that it really is not meant to be like a protein supplement uh, the way that like whey protein or like a soy rice blend or something like that, like a vegan blend um, protein supplement would be used. So it is very different. Please do not use it for actual protein supplementation post-workout. Um, it really is just pre-workout. So just to kind of conclude all this, if you are a runner or another type of athlete and you're experiencing joint pain or tendonitis or you have an injury or other issues, you can absolutely try collagen supplementation, you know, along with all the basics. So I always like you have a little asterisk or caveat, like obviously make sure you're getting adequate nutrition and sleep and you're you know, training and resting and like just doing all the things in a smart way. And yeah, you can absolutely see if it helps you. It's not going to be one of these things where like you take it one or two times and you notice this huge difference. Like it's going to, you need to be doing it consistently uh, for sure. And then if you're not experiencing any issues, you know, do you need collagen? Probably not. I mean, Again, I know it's really trendy and popular, and if you want to use it for skin or as other aesthetic reasons, like that's absolutely fine. You could probably use a much smaller dose in that case. Um, but even if, let's say, you wanted to try adding it, um, because there is like a little bit of evidence out there showing, okay, maybe there is a role in some injury prevention even. I mean, it most, to be honest, it most likely is not going to hurt you. It may, it probably won't do anything or it might not do anything. Um, it most likely will hurt you. Um, but of course, just remember that anytime we're talking about supplementation, there's always a risk involved, just given how poorly regulated the supplement industry is. So whatever you do, whether you are experiencing an injury or other pain, or you just want to give it a try for another reason, always be sure to use a trusted brand, ideally with third-party testing like NSF certified for sport or informed choice whenever possible. So I hope that answers your question. Great question about collagen. I get lots of questions about collagen um, from clients. All right, let's move on to question number two. Hi, Claire. I've been listening to your podcast and your information has really help, been helping me with GI problems I was having after getting into longer distance running and triathlon events. I had gestational diabetes in all three of my pregnancies, so I feel like it has been pounded into my brain, pair carbs with protein, fat, and fiber at all costs. I've learned from experiences now that this is not true for the kind of exercise I do now. Typically, I run first thing in the morning and have something like a Pop-Tart or banana and toast with honey. I run and then I come home and have a breakfast high in protein and easy to digest carbs, then have my fiber and fat mostly in my lunch, dinner, and snacks later in the day. Just like you have talked about and it has helped so much and I feel so good. So my question is, is it important to pair carbs with protein for breakfast on rest days or... Can I keep the protein more towards the end of the day like I do on training days? Sometimes I just want a big bowl of oatmeal without protein powder, you know? But that little voice in the back of my head keeps whispering, pair with protein. Thanks for reading and thank you for your blogs and content. It's really helpful and has been life-changing in many ways. Awesome. Well, first of all, again, thanks, <laughs> thanks for your question. I'm so glad you're finding everything helpful. Uh, and I certainly can understand how having gestational diabetes for three pregnancies can really form certain nutrition habits and, and just have that messaging in your head. So I just want to point out that post-workout 
it is totally okay, just to clarify this, it is totally okay for you to be having fiber and fat. And actually we want you to be having fat, especially like really beneficial fats, like omega-3 fatty acids, for instance, which are anti-inflammatory and can help with the recovery process. Fat also adds some much needed calories, which we need when we're in a caloric deficit. Um, if you did a really hard or long workout, yes, easy to digest carbs may be best as they're digested more quickly and you know they're less filling than higher fiber carbs, which means you're able to get more nutrition in. So if this is one of those situations, then yes, of course, like let's reduce fiber and really go for those. But you know, if it's just like a really easy workout and um, or a shorter workout, then you you can kind of eat normally and have just a balanced meal and you don't need to be like avoiding fiber or anything like that afterwards. Um, so yeah, just wanted to clarify, you don't necessarily, depending on the situation, need to be waiting to eat fiber and certainly you don't need to be waiting to eat fat. We just don't want to overdo these things because we really want to be prioritizing the carbs and the protein um, immediately post-workout. All right, so let's get to your question about rest days. So rest days really shouldn't look all that different from your training days. Um, you know, you may not need quite as many carbs as say like a long training session day, but you know, we also have to think about, okay, well, what did you do yesterday? And what are you doing tomorrow that you have to recover from and prepare for? So, you know, rest days really aren't a time to be pulling back on nutrition, especially since we're not aiming to be an energy balance, but rather we're having, we want to be having some energy buffer in case our body needs it. I'm not sure if you guys listened to my Reds episode with Rebecca McConville, but, you know, she spoke a lot about how, you know, the whole calories in, calories out, and that the concept of energy balance, like that should not be our goal. We need to have some buffer because our body may need to be dipping into our energy savings account and we need to have some energy in that savings account. We don't want to like be overdrawing into that account, kind of that kind of um, idea. So for protein specifically, since that's what that's what you're asking about. Yes, I do recommend spreading protein out across your meals and snacks. It may vary in terms of how much, um, but it does help with fullness and with blood sugar control while, of course, helping to meet your total needs for the day, which, you know, it can be really hard to meet if you're saving all your protein for one chunk of the day. I, I don't think you really meant like saving it for the end of the day because you did mention earlier, like in your lunch and your snack and your dinner. So like you are kind of saying like all that that entire time post-workout. So I think that's what you meant. Um, but in other words, yes, I do want to see protein in your breakfast. But also on your training days, like, you know, just don't be like hoarding protein until um, later in the day, as I said. Again, I don't think that's what you really meant. Um, so if you're working out in the morning, let's say you have that carb rich meal before that you mentioned, right? And you're having a balanced post workout meal with protein and carbs and fats plus color or fruits and veg afterwards. And then you're having protein and carbs in your remaining meals and snacks. And your next meal after that is just like a nice balanced meal. And if you have like a really long training day, you know, like, let's say like, it's kind of going over that meal time, then, you know, you have your pre-workout meal, ideally with a little bit of protein in there, like 10 grams or so. And then after say two or three hours, you're starting to add, you know, five to 10 grams of protein into your performance nutrition, along with your carbohydrates. Because, you know, if you're out there for a lot of hours, you're missing meals and snacks. And this helps with a number of things like muscle protein breakdown and hunger and GI issues. And, Lastly, I just want to mention that you absolutely do not need to be putting protein powder in your oatmeal. Like, I definitely think that tastes gross just personally. So like you said, sometimes you just want your oatmeal without protein powder. Like, absolutely, of course. Do not feel like you have to put protein powder in your oatmeal and like suffer through it. Please don't do that. Um, there are lots of ways to get protein in. You can make your oats with like a milk or a soy milk, for instance. That's an easy way if you're putting like a cup of milk or soy milk that gives you about eight grams in there. Or if you're using like a like fair life milk, for instance, has 13 grams. You could add nuts or nut butters or seeds. You can add, like, this is what I often do once the oatmeal is made. And in my bowl, I add like a really big scoop of Greek yogurt. And it's really yummy, whether it's like a plain with honey or like a vanilla flavored or something like that. And that's really yummy. You could always add eggs on the side or something else on the side to boost protein. So again, protein powder does not have to be this like answer to all things protein. Like we can get it in in other ways. Um, all right. So thanks for that great question. I hope my answer helps. Of course, for all these things, if you ever uh, have follow-up questions or want to clarify anything, just reach out. All right. Question number three. 
I'm trying to figure out where meals fit in on a multi-day event going for Bigfoot 200 in 2025. I was super burnt out in sugary foods by the end of my mammoth 50K and ate a pizza, but how much is the right amount? No way was I running again after a small pizza. What would you recommend for meals in terms of caloric estimates? All right, so that's another great question. Um, this is actually from one of my um, Patreon fans. So uh, I know who this one's coming from. Super exciting about Bigfoot. Super stoked to see you race that. Um, and obviously fueling a 50K and a 200 miler, really, really, really different. Um, there's no one right answer to this question because what works for you will be very individualized, right? But you know, with a 200, you're obviously going a lot slower. There's a lot more hiking. There's some sleeping involved somewhere, right? And there are many, many meal times that are happening while you're out there that, you know, unlike with a 50K, like you can't just skip because it's such a long distance, right? So you do have to have meals. You can't just kind of muscle through it with little snacks or little mini meals or anything like that. So I would say, you know, if a pizza is appealing and you can't run after eating a small one, well, could you hike for a bit while you digest and then run once you're ready? You know, would something like, say, like a plain turkey sandwich or a quesadilla, the plain turkey sandwich, I would definitely put that on like a white roll, like something just like very ready <laughs> with lots of carbs in there. Um, or like a quesadilla, just to name like a couple really simple, common examples. Obviously, we have to think about what's available, what's appealing and what you tolerate. So um, and then in terms of like what we're going for, well, we need carbs, we need salt because you'll need that flavor change. And it's always helpful to get some salt in there. We want some protein and we also want some fat. And especially with the fat, you're gonna have to play around with how much. So um, we do still want to stay fairly low fiber just for tolerance and all that. Um, but in terms of fiber, like you may find fruit really refreshing. It's a nice way to get carbs in here and there. You don't want to like go crazy on the fruit, but it is a really nice way to kind of get a refreshing taste. And that is obviously a source of fiber. So that could be like the one place where we do get a little fiber in there. Um, for timing, you may want to stick with traditional meal times potentially, or maybe you're having like more slightly more frequent, smaller meals, depending on um, when you're sleeping and when you're seeing your crew and what you tolerate and what you want. Um, so again, like it's kind of hard to answer this in like really general terms because this is going to look a little different for everybody. Um, and then as for caloric amounts, you know, I think again, it depends on what your strategy is. Are you trying to have kind of larger meals and that sits well with you and you can like hike for a bit afterwards? Do you feel better if you have slightly more frequent, smaller meals where you're getting these things in? Um, I don't really necessarily have like a set caloric recommendation to be honest. Um, again, it really just depends on, the context and how much you can tolerate because of course you may set out to have that whole pizza and then it comes time to have the pizza and like you're having trouble getting it in you know so i think just having also different strategies with whether it's like liquid nutrition the solid nutrition different taste flavors whatever um, having some different options that you practice is really important too um, generally speaking with ultras, just to kind of zoom out for a bit and look at what we're going for, you know, we're, we're usually aiming for around 250 to 350 calories per hour, um, at a minimum, you know, mostly from carbohydrate with a little bit of protein. So again, that like five to 10 grams, um, per hour. Um, and then when it's time for like a proper meal, you're likely going to be going a bit above that, right? Cause you know, 250, 350 calories, not that much, um, and then you're allowing yourself time to like process what you just ate. So especially for you, since again, I know who this question is coming from. Um, I know that you're not trying to eat a pizza and then rush off. You're not trying to win this race or anything. Um, you are going to have time to like walk a bit and digest and all that. So, um, you know, we can keep that in mind. I think that's all I have to say for this particular question right now. But of course, feel free to reach out if you need more clarification, as I know that my answer was a lot of it depends. And I know that can be really frustrating for a lot of people. All right, let's get to our last question. We're speeding through these questions in a short episode. All right. A coworker brings in chocolate and other candies daily and stopping by the candy bowl and grabbing a large serving at least once daily is now a mindless habit. Do you have suggestions for eliminating this habit? So this is a really great question and very timely because we're now in that holiday stretch of like Halloween to New Year's or almost Halloween. I'm not sure when this episode is going to come out. Um, that is filled with candy and other treats. And that often like really stresses people out. <laughs> Um, which is understandable. Um, so a few things. 
First of all, there's nothing wrong with eating candy if you want to. I actually just wrote all about this in a recent newsletter uh, leading up to Halloween. It went out um, last week, earlier this week, I forget, uh, last week. Um, so I was just reminding um, everyone that you know, no single food or meal or day or even week really defines your health. And actually, there's a lot about our health that is completely out of our control, even if we did all the quote unquote right things with our diet and lifestyle behaviors. Um, that said, obviously certain foods like candy are not health supporting. Okay. Like no one, like we're not going to sit here and, and live in these extremes where we say, um, like, oh my God, candy is toxic and is going to kill you and poison you. Ah, you know, we're not doing that. And we're also not saying like, Hey, candy is the same as every other food and you can eat it all you want. It doesn't matter. Like neither one of those things are true. <laughs> and we, you know, we don't want to live in either of the extremes. So Candy is not health supporting, but that doesn't mean that we have to completely eliminate or avoid it, right? You can include some candy every day if you want to, and if that feels good to you, if you enjoy it, when it is a part of an overall balanced diet. That is what I mean when I say, like, it really doesn't make a difference for the most part. Um, really, like, unless you have a very specific allergy to something in that candy, or we're really dealing with a very specific medical condition, like we we should not be stressing about something like some candy here and there. Okay. Um, we just don't want to consume large amounts of candy of candy on the regular. So if you're mindlessly eating something and you're not enjoying it, and especially if you're feeling unwell as a result, and of course, I don't know the person who asked this question. I'm not sure what that situation is, but let's just say for the sake of argument that these things were hap happening. So, you know, you're mindlessly eating it, maybe enjoy the first piece, but you're not really like enjoying it all that much. The pleasure isn't really happening there. Um, and maybe you're eating, I mean, he said like he's having like a large serving. I don't know what that means, but let's say it's a serving to the point where you don't feel good. This obviously is not a behavior we want to continue, right? Cause like you're not really getting a whole lot out of it. So I'd want to know the following first, why do you view this ha as this habit as something you need to eliminate? So is it because it's mindless and not enjoyable or you view it as bad for health or why, you know, um, you know, how do you feel physically after eating the candy? Do you ever feel sick? Does it feel fine? Does the candy taste good to you or are you kind of meh about it after the first piece or two? You know, when does it stop being enjoyable if it does? So I, I'm kind of wanting to get some clarification around these things. The other main thing I want to know and just an aside here, like, th like if this person were my one-to-one -one client, this is like what I would be asking about just as a little, a little aside for a minute. Um, so the other thing I want to know is why, why are you doing this every workday? You know, are you eating consistent, adequate meals and snacks throughout the day that are satisfying to you, you know, to make sure that you're getting, um, good energy, you know, you have good energy levels and you're satisfying your hunger. And, you know, we also want to make sure that you're not feeling deprived of something you want, because as I know, I've talked about before in this podcast, there's a difference between being like physically full and being satisfied. And, you know, it's not always realistic that we're going to love everything we eat and be completely satisfied and all that. But like, if you're, if you want something and you're not getting it, like you may not be feeling satisfied and you may be seeking something somewhere else. Right. So, and then if you're not eating enough or you're not getting enough calories into your body and, you know, you're kind of hungry, it's a lot harder to resist candy that's right in front of you all the time. Um, it's also harder to resist candy right in front of you if in your brain or if your mind, you're constantly telling yourself you can't have something. So um, another why, you know, that's very, it might be very common reason would be like boredom. You know, sometimes we need a work break or an excuse to walk around and talk to people and you're just kind of bored and eating is fun. It, so maybe it's fun to eat the candy and it's a nice distraction and there's nothing wrong with that. Like, so could you just take one or two pieces and take them back to where you sit and eat them there rather than grab a large serving, as you say, or do you feel like really out of control and you're not feeling like you're able to just take one or two pieces? I know you say it's a mindless habit. You're taking a large serving. So again, I'm kind of trying to, I would want to be getting a little bit more detail here. Um, another question I would have is, are you tired? Are you seeking an energy boost? Are you not sleeping well at night? And again, you're just kind of looking for that quick hit of something. Candy is, of course, quick, yummy energy. So 
does the candy grabbing happen at a certain time of day? Like maybe you're starting to have a little bit of an energy slump and you find yourself wandering over the candy bowl at a certain time of day, or does it happen at different times of day? So that's another thing that we can explore. Um, another thing to explore, if you go back for second helpings of the candy, since you said sometimes you go back for seconds, what is driving that? Is there something going on? Can you notice patterns? So like we're looking for patterns, we're looking for the why. This is like eliminating a habit. It's not just like as simple as like a discipline thing or you know like whatever, just don't do it. You know, we have to kind of understand the why and the reasoning behind it and what's going on to navigate all this and, and learn about it and understand it and thus change it. So um, I kind of talked a little bit about this, but another thing to, to think about is candy something that you view as quote unquote bad and hard to control, generally speaking. And are there other foods that you find yourself feeling out of control around too? You know, uh, you can also think about what happens on the weekends when you're not around that candy bowl. Are you seeking out sweets um, at home or elsewhere? Um, you know, are other things happening? Or is this really just like a work behavior? So once we identify some of the driving fac factors at play, we can start thinking about solutions. So some may be like really quick fixes. Others can be a lot more complicated depending on what your answers are and what's going on. Um, so for example, you know, do you have to walk by this coworker's desk? I don't know what kind of work environment you're in. Maybe it's on the other end of your floor and you don't really have to go there. Maybe there's just like no way of avoiding it. Um, if you're bored and you're wanting to walk around, can you step outside the workplace for a bit and, you know, get some fresh air? Can you call a friend or listen to music? You know, again, just like other stimulation, other things that you can do. If you're feeling low energy and in need of a boost, can you have like a protein and carb containing snack with some fluids? Maybe you're adding a piece of candy to that. You know, maybe you're saying, okay, cool. I'm going to take a piece of candy because it's really yummy. And I know I enjoy the first or second piece. And I'm also going to have like a yogurt or just something else that's giving a little bit more nutrition to fill you up and give you some good energy. Right. So again, the answer isn't like necessarily like cutting out all candy, especially if you enjoy it. But like, what else can we add to that to make it a little bit more beneficial for you? Another thing to think about, are you eating the candy really quickly? You know, and, you know, you talked about mindlessly and a large quantity. So are you eating it really fast? And if so, can you take a little bit less and just slow yourself down again to really like enjoy what you're eating? Or do you, again, do you even enjoy it? Like, I don't know. Um, another thing to think about, like, again, going back to that whole like good versus bad food mentality and, and feeling out of control around things. Um, you know, if you if you are feeling that way, like that means we have a little bit like some deeper work to do. It's not a quick fix. So. I know this seems like a really simple question and it's a really common issue. So that's where I really wanted to talk through it in detail about the types of questions I'd ask, because I want all of you listeners who, you know, anyone else who can relate to this and who have been in that situation, I want you to kind of think in these terms and ask yourself some of these questions. Um, and, and yeah, again, like if you were my client, these are the types of things we'd be talking through to try to like figure out some solutions. Uh, Another thing I'd say is, or I'll say is that, you know, if you do find yourself living by these like quote unquote good and bad food lists and you're feeling out of control around your bad foods when they're around, again, I don't like using these, this terminology around food, but it's so common, like clean eating and good and bad. And I, I shouldn't eat this and all that stuff. So, you know, again, I'm using these things in quotes. Um, you know, if you're feeling guilty after eating certain foods that you label as bad um, and you know, maybe you're struggling when you're out of your normal eating routine. So this is really common for people who are eating out or you're traveling or the holidays, et cetera. Um, you might want to check out, I have a new freebie called Food Rules, Fears, and Beliefs that you might find helpful. It's under, it's on my website under nutrition resources. I actually just reorganized my entire website. So it's a lot easier to find my resources. And under, if you go to nutrition resources, there'll be a drop down menu and you'll see like free nutrition resources. And then I have my low cost mini guides and um, my course and all that. So if you go to the free ones, you'll see food rules, fears, and beliefs. And it used to be part of my everyday eating mini guide, but I decided to make it available separately for free because so many people struggle this time of year. And again, it's a stretch from like October through January. And then of course, January 1st, everyone dumps on the diet bandwagon. I just like do not want that for you guys. So um, it's a basically a worksheet. Uh, it's not a quick fix by any means. It's more of like a self-awareness exercise, I guess you would call it, that can really help you highlight, you know, 
how you view and relate to food as a starting point to healing your relationship to food and body. And of course, link to in the show notes. You can also find it on my nutrition resources freebie page that I just mentioned. So summing up this listener question, how to eliminate candy, this candy habit. So again, figure out why it's happening. Explore your own rules, beliefs, fears, you know, surrounding candy, if you have any. And I would say just experiment with some solutions. Um, And, you know, again, if this is like really a struggle, that could be a reason to work with someone to kind of, if this is like more of a theme, it's not just with candy, but like with all foods, then we have a little bit more work to do. All right. I hope that answers your question. But of course, please reach out if it doesn't or you have any follow-up questions. So thanks again, everyone, for submitting your questions. I would love for you to keep them coming and for you to send me more as soon as I have enough. I, I think having at least four or five. So today we had four if I have like four or five, I'll do another episode. So as soon as I get that. So if you ever just have a question, you know, don't wait for me to ask for them. Just like send it and say, Hey, the next time you didn't ask me anything episode, can you please include my question? And then just like send it my way. I would love, love, love to do another episode like this. So that is our show for today. I hope you all enjoyed this one and found it helpful. Maybe you can relate to some of the things that were being asked. If you did, please make sure that you hit follow and subscribe wherever you listen. And if you have a minute, I would always, I'm always so grateful if you can write a review and rate it, you know, again, wherever you listen so that more people can help, uh, can start following and enjoying my show. And if you're able to support the show financially, I do have a Patreon page. Um, You know, any amount is appreciated in terms of donations, but I think it's the membership is about $6 per month. I call it buy me a fancy latte because that's how much it costs around here. And, um, you know, that gets you lots of great perks like merchandise and some big discounts on my digital products and much more. All right. Thank you so, so much for listening and for all your support. Again, please feel free to email me as always, Claire at eatforendurance.com with your questions or feedback or comments, top requests, all that stuff. All right. Thank you so much. I will see you next time.